Good morning, everybody. You are listening to or watching A Cup of St. Joe, where I serve an espresso shot of teaching and devotion to St. Joseph during Pope Francis's Year of St. Joseph. Today, I am very happy to be speaking with a priest from the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis in Minnesota, Father John Paul Erickson. He is currently the pastor of Transfiguration Parish in Minnesota, and I saw on their social media because I followed them a while ago because I wanted to watch the funeral of Father William Bayer as it was being celebrated there, and, and uh, another friend of mine goes to church there, and so I was aware of some of the happenings there and saw that Father Erickson gave a few talks on uh, St. Joseph and the sacraments, and I thought it would be great, especially as we come up to Corpus Christi, to talk about St. Joseph and the Eucharist. And then I found out he talked about St. Joseph and the Sacrament of Penance. So wonderful material for us to discuss today. So welcome to the Cup of St. Joe, Father Erickson. Father, very grateful for the invitation and uh, honored to be with you. And uh, thank you for the chance. You also tell me offline who your, who your friend is so I can I can uh, get some more intel here, but, but thank you for the invitation. Sure, will do. And now my understanding is too, you have a great background in sacramental theology. You were in charge of the Office of Divine Worship for St. Paul, Minnesota. For the yeah, I was. There. Yeah, that's exactly right, Father. So I, I in 2008, uh, I was asked by then Archbishop Neinstead to be the director of the Office of Worship. It was quite a surprise, quite an honor, but a surprise. And so for 10 years, both under our previous Archbishop, as well as under Archbishop Hebda, who's our current uh, shepherd, I served as director of the Office of Worship. So they were wonderful 10 years. Uh, you get a chance to really see the diocese from a different perspective and to be a part of the celebration of, the, of really the heart of the church, which is the sacramental life of the church. It was a beautiful gift. So I did some, some further studies at Mundelein Liturgical Institute uh, out in Chicago. Um, and so, but ever since 2018, I have been having a real job and that is as pastor of a parish. So I'm no longer a chancery rat <laughs> I, uh, I I actually have to work for a living, so I'm grateful for it. It's a wonderful parish, and as you say, you mentioned Father William Bear, who was my predecessor, well beloved pastor here, and of course a, a father to many young priests across the across the country, because he was rector of St. John Vianney Seminary here in St. Paul for many years. So thankful to be able to follow in his footsteps. He himself, who had a great devotion to St. Joseph. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, St. Joseph, we call him the spiritual father of so many, and we take him through the consecration of St. Joseph or entrustment as our spiritual father. And Father Bear was, as you mentioned, a spiritual father to so many priests uh, throughout the country who uh, attended St. John Vianney Seminary. Now, as a priest and as a pastor yourself, uh, you celebrate the sacraments every day. You hear confessions, you celebrate mass, you anoint people, celebrate baptisms, all of these things. And so that's probably what drove you to, to talk and preach on kind of this topic that isn't really addressed much, St. Joseph and the sacraments. And I'm very curious, the connection between St. Joseph and the Holy Eucharist. Yeah, thank you, Father. Uh, it is not a, as, as, as you say, it's not a, it's not a connection that one would normally assume. It's not obvious, uh, but I do think it's there. And, so, and you're quite right. The reason why I wanted to speak about uh, the St. Joseph part's fairly obvious. Our, our, the, the context of it was a 40-hour Eucharistic uh, celebration at the parish, um, and, and this is the year of St. Joseph. It began on March 19th, the Feast of St. Joseph. All the pieces were in place to have St. Joseph be a focal point. But the sacraments are of a special importance, again, as you say, because we celebrate it every day, and, and again, they're at the heart of our, of our life of faith. And frankly, Father, I don't know if this is the case where you are, but one thing that we are noticing is a lot of people uh, that that were, uh, you know, told to to remain at a distance when COVID really was at its kind of its initial stage of of of, of concern. Uh, some of those people have not come back, and I wanted just to hammer home the point about how important the sacraments are for a life of faith. And obviously, in some cases, it's not possible to participate. Uh, we get all that. We, we've been through all that. But now, certainly here in the Twin Cities and in beautiful idyllic Oakdale, where Transfiguration is found, uh, we have all of our safety protocols in place. So we want to continue to hammer home to people, uh, this is important to be here and to be present in the community and to receive our Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity. So my approach, Father, to the talk on the Eucharist and Joseph really was to focus on 
uh, of course, the scriptural reality of Joseph. So you begin there. Obviously, that's the securest place uh, for any theology of Joseph is the Bible itself. And um, so I, I used as, as, my, as my outline uh, the dynamic of the, 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 revel the revelation of Mary as being, of course, with child and, and how Joseph dealt with that. Uh, and I made the connection between that and the preparation for Mass. And then I spoke about how Joseph hears from God through the angel, you know, do not be afraid. Um, and I use that as the connection with praying the Mass itself. So while you are at Mass itself, how do you pray it? So the, the first part was about preparation. What is Joseph's attitude towards Mary? How does that reveal that we should prepare for Mass uh, Joseph's openness to Gabriel, or not Gabriel, excuse me, to the dream, excuse me, the dream's revelation. How, how does that, how does that manifest how we should, how we should enter into prayer at the mass? And then, of course, the third section was on practicing the mass. How, how, how do we live the mass out in the world? And that was connected to Joseph's taking Mary into his home. And uh, so those are the three sections. And the way that I, um, just very briefly, I, I fleshed out the first section was primarily talking about Joseph's deep concern for justice. You know, we hear about Joseph as the righteous man, and he is concerned about the good name of Mary. He wants to preserve her good name, so he has a concern for justice. And I, I, I tried to link this to the fact that in our own preparation for Mass, our, this needs to be at the forefront of our mind. How is, how is our relationship, first of all, of course, with God, to whom we owe the primary the primary duty, uh, he has the primary claim upon upon our our assent, upon our obedience, but also a, how is our relationship with other people? So oftentimes, I think very good and pious people can sometimes forget this piece. We can think of the spiritual life and the, and the mass as primarily, and and I, I should back up because it is primarily our relationship with God. But how is it impacting how we treat one another? And our preparation for Mass needs to be connected to how we treat the poor and their rights, how we treat those in our family. Are we, are we giving to them what is their due? This is all remote preparation for the Mass, because insofar as we are able to fulfill our, our, our obligations and fulfill their rights and our duties, uh, we'll, be, we'll be better open to the, to the graces of the Mass. And then with prayer, uh, you know, I one area... Um, uh, it was maybe a little bit, a little bit of a stretch, a little bit forced. Maybe you, you'll be the judge, Father. But you know, Joseph, he he's living a life where where he can hear the voice of God. Now, this, of course, God is speaking to him in in a dream. So I get it; it's a little bit different. Uh, but still, we can imagine a man, just man, the righteous man, a man who who, who fulfills the will of God, as a man who has who has a, a well ordered life. And part of praying the Mass, um, in the Mass itself, is, is listening, is meditating, is, is, is striving, striving for that interior silence uh, that we need to have to really let the Word penetrate us. And I tried to make the point, kind of a practical suggestion there, that, you know, uh, taking long walks, uh, you know, meditating upon beautiful things, making sure that there is times of silence in our life, all of that certainly as a way to prepare for the Mass too, but it's also, it's a way to train our inner ear, our spirit, to receive the gifts of the, of the Mass at the Mass itself. So, so we are better listeners, we're better, we're better meditators, um, like Joseph himself was. Um, and then finally, I promise you finally, uh, in terms of the practicing of the Mass, you know, I, I talked about Joseph, when he, is, when he is told what to do, he does it. He doesn't dilly-dally, he doesn't, he doesn't think to him and haw. No, he, he wakes up and he accomplishes what he is asked to do. And I encourage people to have practical, real resolutions for themselves when they leave Mass. So maybe it's during Holy Communion as, as, they're, as they're receiving our Lord. What will I do today, today or tomorrow, uh, that is sacrificial, that is for others, that will further the kingdom of God? We can't just, I don't think, leave the Mass and, and just sort of have a general sense of peace and well-being. That's all well and good. Please, God, we got it. But there has to be some practical consequences. You know, Father, 
part of a good retreat, making good resolutions. And that's true for the mass itself. We have to have, we have to have uh, things happen after mass in our own life. So uh, that was the outline I used for, for Joseph and the Eucharist. I think too, there could even be another component to this and, and the reality of Bethlehem and Jesus mm. being born and moving into adoration and how Joseph was there with Mary adoring the Christ child in a sense. Amen. Like, like, I can't believe that this has just happened, that, that the God of the universe, Emmanuel, who he names Jesus, Joseph would have been given that responsibility of naming him, that that uh, that they're adoring together. And uh, that's another kind of Eucharistic imagery, I think, there as well. Beautiful. No, abs 100%, absolutely. Um, yes, and, and such a, and again, I, I would just offer, obviously, always important, because it lies at the heart of, of our life of faith and our final end, the eternal contemplation of God. But I think it needs to be emphasized, especially now in our world that is so quick and fast and constantly on the move. And so the idea of contemplation, of really looking at things and people and Jesus and meditating and wondering, that's a, that's a virtue that we have to be pushed in now more than ever. And Joseph does that. Now, the other sacrament that you also spoke about was reconciliation. And I guess in my own mind, I could think of maybe where you went with this, because especially in the litany of St. Joseph, we talk about a lot of different virtues of St. Joseph that, you know, he was the mirror, uh, no, maybe Mary is mirror of patience, but model of patience, or um, there are lots of different virtues there. Uh, Joseph, most obedient, most just, most pure, whatever. And so maybe I, I'm thinking if if I was giving this talk, I would probably look at the virtues of Joseph and the vices that we have and how we can ask him to help us to pray for them. So then we use his virtues kind of to expose the sins of our life. But I'm wondering what direction did you go? Yeah, that would have been a wonderful way to go, Father. Thank you. That, that'll be round two. I'm going to use I'm going to use those. <laughs> Please. Uh, I did. I, I did follow kind of the same format as as the talk on the Eucharist in the sense of continuing on in the Gospel of Matthew in, in the drama, of course, of the flight to Egypt, and even, even before that, uh, inviting the Blessed Mother into his own home. And so I, I you know, the, the expression of God through the, you know, through the dream, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, this expression, first of all, given to Joseph. So I encourage people, uh, do not be afraid of confession, because as, as you know, Father, at times it's interesting, it, it's, it's a, counterintuitive, at least to me, that sometimes people who have been involved in church life for years, for years, literally, uh, are not always as regular with confession as one would assume, you know? So you can even get someone who, who, was, who was regularly volunteering and, and a part of the parish life, and then you come to discover that, well, gosh, this, this person has a million for a and it's almost always because of fear. There's a sense of fear and shame there. So I talked about that, about the need to overcome that, and um, you know, I offer just a couple of reflections about why we shouldn't be afraid and, and the fact that I am always filled with deep admiration for those who come and confess sincerely and truly, always, always, without fail. If someone is truly trying to express their sorrow to God, uh, it's very moving to me. Um, I also spoke about, you know, when Joseph is commanded, rise and flee to Egypt uh, to protect the Lord, of course, from Herod. Uh, I use this as a reminder to the congregation that um, we have to express restitution for sin. You know, the reality of Joseph and Mary and Jesus going to Egypt, this place which represents, of course, for the chosen people, a place of slavery, the place, an image which can remind us of when we sin, that damage that we do, it's not just to be forgiven. We also have to have to make restitution for it. And of course, you know, uh, the temporal punishment due to sin is very real. And so I reiterate that to people and to embrace that, not, not to run from that, um, but to embrace the fact that you must make up for this and, and you have to acknowledge that your sin has done damage to you and to the body of Christ and you have to make up for that. And I, and I use that as a chance to talk about indulgences and to talk about some of the graces of this year of St. Joseph, but also the importance of regular penance, um, even for those who are far along in the spiritual life, regular penance to embrace, you might say, the, the life of Egypt, to embrace that uh, for ultimate liberation. And then, I, and then I spoke about the final point was Joseph is commanded by the angel, rise and go back to Israel. Herod is dead. And so I use that image of Israel as the, as the place of forgiveness. 
the, the city of peace, where, where Joseph goes back to Israel. It represents um, uh, the state that all of us must come to must, the Lord commands it, of forgiving other people. We have to, we have to come to a place of peace, a place where we actively, consciously forgive them, which as you know, Father, is a much different thing than, than the pain being, being gone or a desire for justice. All those things are perfectly good, but, but we, do have to, we do have to strive to forgive. And so I use the image of, of going back to Israel, going to, going to this place of, of redemption as a place, as a reminder to the congregation, you must forgive. If you are going to be at peace, if you're going to be at home, you must forgive. Wow. I really liked your three-part approach and using the scriptures kind of to guide that and to how we can approach the sacrament of reconciliation. And did, did you talk about the other sacraments as well? Did you do a whole seven-part series or did you lump the other ones together? Or? Yeah, good question, brother. No, I, I didn't, although although I could, I should. I, I, I got to think about that. You know, I think, I think about like with marriage, of course, that's fair, you know, relatively speaking, fairly clear cut. Joseph, you know, the most chaste spouse and the virtues of fatherhood. Uh, that's pretty clear. Anointing of the sick, I'd have to be, I, you know, certainly he's the patron saint of the dying and of a well-prepared death. So I think there's a connection there. You know, confirmation, uh, that could be kind of an intriguing one because, you know, we speak of the, the blessed mother's spouse is the Holy Spirit. So, you know, what's the relationship with Joseph and, and with, with, the, with, the, with the Holy Spirit that was, you know, the his own his own beloved spouse. What how did how does that work? What does that mean? Um, so yeah, I I, I uh, I'm gonna have to think about that. That might have to be next year's forty hours. <laughs> sure, definitely. Yeah, you know, just thinking about the con uh, confirmation. Um, I I did a, a I, I wrote these rosary reflections called praying the rosary with Saint Joseph. They, they're all oh, published my. on Althea, and so I tried to make a connection to each of the rosary mysteries and, and how we can use Saint Joseph or incorporate him into that prayer, especially during the year of Saint Joseph. And for confirmation, as you touched upon, or for the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Um, just the fact that Joseph lived in such close proximity to the Holy Spirit, that was kind of the illusion that I drew out there that, that, you know, Mary, as you mentioned, the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And so, so having the Spirit's presence so much uh, in the life uh, of the home of Nazareth and, and how he would have been aware of that. So, um, but also too, I'm sure he needed those gifts of the Holy Spirit. He needed the gift of understanding as, as he heard from the angel, take Mary into your home. Don't be afraid. Yeah, um, no, amen. Yeah, exactly. No, I, 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 yeah, I think the exploration of, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit could be quite fruitful to see how those were lived out in Joseph, both as manifested in scripture and in the tradition of the church and her piety. I think it could be quite beautiful. You know, one image that came to me, Father, was speaking of confirmation of the Holy Spirit, you know, the, the father of a family, you know, so much of his role is, is of course, to protect, to provide, and in some sense, for the ancient world, I would guess it, it, it probably, maybe I'm wrong about this, maybe I'm wrong, but kind of the, tend, the tender of the fire, you know, the one who kept the fire going. And uh, Joseph is kind of a, a protector of a household where the Holy Spirit was truly present. And Joseph knew that, and he, and he protected that place as a sacred place um, so that the fire could warm and strengthen, you know, his 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 the whole Jesus, uh, but also his own, you know, blessed, the blessed one whom he had chosen to be his own vessel. So lots of beautiful things. I got, we, we got our confirmation. I should come up on Thursday. Our kids are getting confirmed. So I'll be thinking about it all mass. Thinking, well, we're St. Joseph here. This will be good. <laughs> That's great. Now I have a question, I guess, too, you know, as a priest, um, we, we have devotions, of course, we have devotions to, uh, to the Blessed Mother, highly encouraged, and, and we pick up our own devotion to saints along the way, like a lot of people are devoted to St. Therese of Lisieux or some other saint that they've taken as kind of a, a patron, or you've read their writings. For me, I, I'm deeply uh, touched by the writings of Bernard of Clairvaux, who, mm -hmm. who I've done a lot of writing and reading and research on for my thesis. So um, I'm wondering, in terms of Saint Joseph, was was he a part really of your priestly life, spirituality, or do you think the year of Saint Joseph has really given new spotlight to him in your own spirituality? Yeah, great question, Father. I have to be honest with you. Certainly, in my own discernment, Joseph was really not on the scene. I mean, of course, I, I honored him, I acknowledge him, of course, but yeah, much, much, 
much more prominent role to the Blessed Mother and, and to some other saints. I will say that, that I, I've been very fortunate uh, to get to know the Little Sisters of the Poor very, very well. My, uh, my, my sister is a Little Sister of the Poor. Oh, wow. To develop a relationship with that community who have such, such a deep, intimate commitment to Joseph and to his providential care, that's been very moving to me. And, um, and so to see how he has looked after these dear brides of Christ and how much his, his humility has mattered to them, that's, that's been very impactful. But you're exactly right. The year of St. Joseph has been a special opportunity for me to grow in devotion to him. And even preparing for these talks was a time to reflect beneficially in my own life. Um, and, and the two biggest things throughout this year of reflection, number one is the love of silence that we as priests, you know, we, we do so much talking, we do so much writing, we do so much, you know, uh, stuff that, that's good and wonderful. But unfortunately, I think it can also really tempt us away from that deep mm -hmm. interior life that we are called to have. And, um, and Joseph reminds us of the importance of that by his silence. And the other thing is, is he, he does what he is asked to do. And, uh, you know, I don't know about you, Father, but, but I do not like conflict. I just don't like it. And, uh, but there are many, many times as a priest, and certainly as a pastor, where I just got to do it. And Joseph reminds me of, of the need to simply fulfill your duty, even at great cost to yourself, or if it's painful, you do it. You do it as a man, you do it as a disciple, you do it as a priest. Uh, so it's been a great year of grace, and I, and I, I want him in more deeply. Uh, we actually were having a capital campaign here at our here at our parish for four million bucks. Um, <laughs> wow! For this it's it's a debt reduction campaign, so it's you know not terribly exciting. You know we want people we want people to pay off debt, uh, but we've entrusted it to St. Joseph, and I have no reason to doubt that he will get it done. Um, and uh, I look forward to honoring him in some way as part of that process. You know we're thinking about maybe a shrine outside, um, but we definitely want to spread the cult. So. Sure, definitely. And, you know, I know you used to be a regular on relevant radio um, on morning air, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. I, I say the mass at relevant radio uh, quite a bit, especially when Father Rocky is out of town. So yeah. uh, I have a very close relationship with their apostle. But you must know that Father Rocky went to the to the shrine in Canada and uh, when they were really in financial dire need and um, relevant radio now is one of the most successful Catholic radio networks throughout the country. So um, yeah, St. Joseph will help retire that debt. I'm sure. No, so. I, I, I have no doubt. I, I, his resume is very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, this is, this has been such a wonderful conversation, Father Erickson. I've been blessed by it very much so. And uh, I know everyone else who will be watching or listening has also taken so much away. Uh, I, I've truly enjoyed it. So I'd like to thank you so much for joining me today on A Cup of St. Joe. My pleasure, Father. Thank you. Thanks for your great work. And again, you honor me with the request. So thank you. Yes. And I invite you now to stay tuned as we pray the litany of St. Joseph. Today, Father Erickson and I have shared an espresso shot of teaching and devotion to St. Joseph during Pope Francis's year of devotion. I hope you'll join me again next week. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Illustrious Son of David, pray for us. Light of Patriarchs, pray for us. Spouse of the Mother of God, pray for us. Chaste Guardian of the Virgin, pray for us. Foster Father of the Son of God, pray for us. Watchful Defender of Christ, pray for us. Head of the Holy Family, pray for us. Joseph, Most Just, pray for us. Joseph, Most Chaste, pray for us. Joseph, Most Prudent, pray for us. Joseph, Most Valiant, pray for us. Joseph, Most Obedient, pray for us. Joseph, Most Faithful, pray for us. Mirror of Patience, pray for us. Lover of poverty, pray for us. Model of workmen, pray for us. Glory of home life, pray for us. Guardian of virgins, pray for us. Pillar of families, pray for us. Solace of the afflicted, pray for us. Hope of the sick, 
pray for us. Patron of the dying, pray for us. Terror of demons, pray for us. Protector of Holy Church, pray for us. Guardian of the Redeemer, pray for us. Servant of Christ, pray for us. Minister of Salvation, pray for us. Guide in times of trouble, pray for us. Protector of exiles, pray for us. Protector of the afflicted, pray for us. Protector of the poor, pray for us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. He made him the Lord of his household and prince over all his possessions. Let us pray. O God, who in thine ineffable providence did vouchsafe to choose blessed Joseph to be the spouse of thy most holy mother, grant we beseech thee that he whom we venerate as our protector on earth may be our intercessor in heaven, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen.